Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, serve them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Ted Gleichman. Ted is the chair of the LNG Committee of the Oregon Chapter of the Sierra Club and also a member of the Steering Committee for Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy. So welcome to the show, Ted. Thanks, David. Yeah, great, yeah. So uh, we primarily want to talk about your your activities with the Sierra Club, but just, just for a moment, just to tell people, uh, Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy, what, what is that about? It's a nonprofit that's focused around feed-in tariffs, which is the best and most effective method around the planet for generating new renewable energy projects, especially on a democratized and decentralized basis. Uh, it allows people to be paid for putting renewable energy projects on their homes or on their land. Uh, it's the way that, by the utilities uh, that use the renewable energy. Uh, and it's the way that Germany has become the global leader in renewable energy uh, with a, uh, a solar resource, uh, mm -hmm. the amount of sunlight that actually hits Germany, that's uh, even less than Western Oregon where we occasionally get rain and don't think of ourselves as a particularly sunny state. Oh, yeah, I actually, on occasion we get sun. <laughs> <laughs> we do sometimes, right. and that's even better for collecting mm -hmm. solar energy. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy is a, a group dedicated to bringing that system uh, of governmental incentives through the utility companies uh, for individual generation of renewable energy, solar energy, and, and other forms of renewable energy. Uh, in Germany, 51% of all the renewable energy they're generating uh, is owned by individuals, farmers, uh, small cooperatives, people getting together. Uh, the same thing is happening now in Ontario, and uh, it's starting to happen in the United States. Rhode Island and Vermont are the leaders at this point in the U.S., and Oregon will have a chance to become a leader on this. Um, in 2013 and 2014. Okay, because you folks are working on it. Yes. Right, yeah. And, and you said to democratize the grid, I think you said. Yes. Uh, and that, that's to say that small home, homeowners or small business people would be able to easily access um, um, yes. um, solar or renewable energy production. And that's kind of 
as opposed to what we currently have, which is really, really large, pr primarily multinational corporations, which are doing huge arrays or yep. wind farms in eastern right. Oregon and elsewhere. Right. One of the projects that the federal government has funded with um, stimulus funds uh, is, I think, $1.2 billion in the California desert uh, owned by Google and General Electric. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to have that replacing fossil fuels, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not the same thing as generating power in the neighborhood that stays in the neighborhood. Right, yeah, and, and, and it, empowers, it empowers people rather than corporations. Exactly. Right, yeah, well, hence democratizing the grid. Exactly. Okay, great, good. So let's talk about uh, the uh, Oregon chapter of the Sierra Club and your work with them. Uh, well, how, how, how long have you been working with, with, the, uh, with the Sierra Club? Well, I've been a member um, on and off uh, uh, my uh, uh, entire adult life, uh, and that's obviously, if there's anybody uh, watching the show who's uh, a 20-something, uh, uh, David and I are obviously members of the generation <laughs> that's been destroying the earth for your generation. Right, yeah, uh, right. So, uh, but some of us still want to make a difference, and, and here we are. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I got involved with the uh, LNG issue um, in 2008, and then more actively uh, about a year ago, and the Sierra Club is the only one of the the Big Ten, Big Green organizations that is really membership controlled, uh, grassroots controlled, uh, not not just a staff driven organization. Mm -hmm. And so the the value of that opportunity is to work on a grassroots basis from a community organizing perspective. Okay, and, and you said LNG, just so that everybody knows what LNG is. What's LNG? Liquefied natural gas. Uh -huh. And when you hear the term natural gas, the important thing to think about is methane. Uh, natural gas, when we burn it in our kitchens, is 100% methane with a tiny percentage of an odorant uh, added uh, at the refinery so you can smell it if a pipe breaks. Uh, so methane, CH4, one of the most powerful greenhouse gases. When we pull it out of the ground, it always includes a lot of other hydrocarbons like benzene and propane and other chemicals as well, heavy metals as well. Those things are then removed at the refinery as it's delivered then onto us. Natural gas used to be known as swamp gas. Uh, we've all uh, encountered that version of methane, uh, which has some other components in it, mm -hmm. but it's one of the most effective rebrandings in history. And the reason that's important is because of the myth that this is somehow a clean fuel. It's not. It's a fossil fuel. Yeah. Burning it creates carbon dioxide. Okay. And it's so, this, but this myth of, of clean natural gas is a myth that's, that's been developed and promoted by the industry itself. It so has indeed. It has indeed. I mean, we're the fossil fuels industry. You can trust us. Yes. Just ask British Petroleum, BP, and the Gulf Coast. I mean, uh -huh. what could possibly go wrong? Uh -huh. Right. So, yeah. Right. So, as they're talking about doing this uh, large pipeline from Canada to the Gulf Coast, the, the Gulf uh, states, uh, we have to kind of wonder the same thing. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. the, that's the you're talking about the Keystone, Keystone XL yes. XL uh -huh. pipeline from the Alberta tar sands mm -hmm. uh, down to the the refineries and ports in Texas, 1,700 mile route. That's been. I actually had the privilege of being in Washington uh, last uh, August and September and was arrested at the White House. One of 1,252 people. Great. And, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was such a lightweight arrest. I mean, it was. It was all these all these guys in the U.S. Park Police were on overtime, and they're arresting middle class people who say thank you when you slap the handcuffs uh -huh. on them. And normally, of course, they're dealing with vomiting rowdy drunks in the park. And oh, so it, this was so easy was, duty was, for them. Yeah, they were so happy <laughs> uh -huh, to be right. uh, okay. off right. their normal duty. But uh -huh. the the point was that the 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 Alberta tar sands is the dirtiest fossil fuel on the planet. It's not oil. It's technically called bitumen, and uh, it's the second largest pool of carbon on the planet after Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Only 3% of it has been exploited so far. Uh, much of that is running into the United States through a pipeline called Keystone, and so the new pipeline is Keystone XL, extra large, uh -huh. uh, to 
take that much more out of it, but they want to run it now all the way to Texas. It's going into the upper Midwest now. They had a terrible spill into the Kalamazoo River in Michigan, which caused much sickness in the neighborhood from the fumes that came off of it because this is such an ugly, dirty fossil fuel. Um, but going to Texas is the gateway to Europe and to Asia for this Alberta tar sands fuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when I, when I watch my evening national news, I see <laughs> almost every evening they advertise them with this woman in this business suit right. and looks, looks right. very sharp and, and yes. uh, has, has this air of uh, trust me about right. her, who tells me that the tar sands oil from Canada, which she implies we actually own, um, is both is going to stay in the United States, and well, you're suggesting it's not going to stay here. In fact, um, Ron Wyden uh, proposed an amendment to the uh, the new transportation bill in the Senate um, uh, here at the the beginning of March that would have required it to stay in the United States, would uh -huh. have prohibited export if the pipeline is ultimately built, and uh, there were a total of 34 U.S. Senators who were willing to agree with that. Uh -huh. um, not enough to actually put it into the bill, mm -hmm. but yeah. so, no, yeah. there, there's an explicit uh, goal of exporting uh, this stuff, and in fact, the government of Canada has been fighting with the European Union because it's so dirty, it doesn't meet their standards for combustion of fossil fuels, mm. uh, and they've been trying to get those standards, the government of Canada has been trying to get those standards eased so they could get the stuff to Europe if it gets to the Gulf Coast. China doesn't have the same problem with uh, mm -hmm. dirty emissions, and so uh, that's likely where it would end up if they're able, if they're successful uh, mm -hmm. in exploiting this. Mm -hmm. And this is important in terms of the LNG issue yes. and the, the um, the, the general question that we face with fossil fuels exports, in, including coal, because all these fossil fuels share the same characteristics. There's not a one that's any, any better uh, than any other. They've been wonderful for us. Uh, they've given us the industrial society and the, the privileges and the pleasures and the benefits that we live with. Uh, this, what, what Tom Hartman calls uh, the exploitation of ancient sunlight. Uh, but we've now passed a tipping point where fossil fuels have turned from a virtue into a liability. Mm -hmm. And we see that now increasingly every day with climate disruption. Uh, extreme weather is the way that most people are becoming most familiar with climate, climate disruption most quickly. Uh, my favorite local example is a year ago in January, there was uh, nine inches of rain in 24 hours on Lolo Pass Road on the, the southern flanks of, of Mount Hood uh, in the middle of January when it should have been snow. It melted a lot of snow that was already up there. The Sandy River crested at 22 feet above flood stage uh, in 24 hours, and it took out three homes and, and ruined the rest of the neighborhood along uh, that road up above government camp. Mm -hmm. now, and that was just one little microclimate impact. Last year, um, we had the worst drought in history, uh, in recorded history, uh, in Texas and Oklahoma, worse than the Dust Bowl. Uh, I was on the East Coast right after Hurricane Irene for this tar sands protest, and there were people without power in Connecticut, uh, not really what you think of as, as a deprived low industrial area um, for 11 days. Mm -hmm. Not a good way to keep your ice cream frozen. <laughs> and the tornado load that the, the U.S. went through last year was double mm -hmm. the historical average. Right, and then this year we were having all those tornadoes which have just been in the news in the past week yeah, or exactly. so. Yeah, uh, exactly. Starting right, a little which early. Is, which is very early and very intense. We all know that the weather is changing. Mm -hmm. It's tough to face up to. Yeah. Uh, because it's painful to think about having to change our lifestyle. But we started by talking about renewable energy. You know, the good news is that we're ready for prime time with renewable energy now. Uh, we can create clean, green, good jobs, union jobs, union scale jobs, with technologies that are ready to go right now. So why are we continuing 
down this path of destruction and deprivation mm -hmm. that fossil fuels are now bringing to us when we could be doing a World War II style mobilization that changes the method by which we generate our energy and fuel our factories and warm our homes mm -hmm. with technologies that are available right now. Right. And I would assume that you will agree with me when they say that the reason we don't do that is because of the vast sums of money which the petroleum and these other um, natural resource companies are able to put into our political system. <laughs> Uh, I think you're right on target there. We, <laughs> right. we do share that value. I uh, saw an interesting statistic on this recent vote, um, just here at the, the beginning of March, on the Keystone Pipeline uh, in, in the Senate. Fifty-six senators voted in favor of it, including uh, 11 Democrats. And together, those senators had on average received, all, all of them, including the 45 Republicans that were also in favor, five times as much money from the fossil fuels industry mm -hmm. as the um, uh, 42 senators who voted against it, two or two Republicans were absent. But the, uh, just a coincidence, I'm sure, uh, I'm that sure. all of right. this, I mean, mm -hmm. right. it's hard to imagine a member of Congress being influenced by receiving no. hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. from an industry. Right. Uh, Each of them would surely deny it. I, I'm confident that <laughs> yes. we can trust them on that subject. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, so we've been talking mostly about what's happening on the East Coast. Let's, let's move back to the West Coast, which is where we, where we were really intending to talk about. <laughs> and let's talk about the LNG uh, here on the West Coast and uh, the terminals that they've been talking about building. Yeah, this process has been underway for the better part of a decade now, and there were really four major proposals that came um, into, into the, the political and economic life of, of of Oregon here. Uh, uh, the status on those uh, in terms of building LNG terminals um, on, on the west coast, on, on, the, co on the Oregon coast and uh, at the mouth of the Columbia River is you know, natural gas is a gas um, and, and a high volume gas and if you want to move it across the ocean to sell it you have to liquefy it which reduces the volume to one six hundredth of uh, its natural volume at, at room temperature uh, and requires taking it down to minus 261 degrees Fahrenheit. This requires some industrial equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these huge plants, these huge terminals need to be built on a coast. You can't run, you can move it by pipelines um, over a landmass, but not through the oceans. Uh, and so the, the pitch was that we could increase U.S. energy security by importing natural gas uh, via liquefying at LNG from Russia and Indonesia uh, and plus create a lot of good temporary construction jobs and a handful of good permanent jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, And there would have to be pipelines once it gets to the coast or to the Columbia uh, and run it to run it into the existing natural gas network. Well, it turns out that in 2001, when uh, Vice President Cheney ran a series of top secret energy industry meetings in the White House, uh, which uh, Justice Scalia wrote the decision on a, a few years ago, s saying that, that we, the citizens, don't have any right to know what they talked about, who was in the meetings, to see the minutes, to see the notes, to see uh, the decision, decisions that they made. That's all mm -hmm. conducted on, on uh, publicly owned property at, at public expense uh, on, on the public clock. And so, of course, it's top secret. Of course. So right. mm -hmm. uh, makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, uh, transparency only works for organizations like grassroots organizations. They <laughs> right. all have to be transparent. <laughs> right. Exactly. But when you get exactly. to the upper levels, they're... Thank they goodness no that. union people were invited uh, yes, to those right. meetings. <laughs> they certainly would have had to, had uh, to expose uh, yes, uh, all of So the... Um, in 2005, there were a series of amendments to the Energy Acts based on things that we now know these, the, the energy industry was, was, was planning for this process. Um, and they directly affected LNG and its kissing cousin, which is fracking, or as I like to call it, renegade fracking. Fracking is hydrofracturing. It's the process of pumping fluids at high pressure into a well and breaking up the rock formations uh, that uh, the hydrocarbons are mixed in with from um, the development of of this this 
product, this resource mm -hmm. through ancient sunlight. Uh, and six or seven years ago, we got to a point, thanks in fact to government investment, where we could do a really good job with horizontal drilling. So now these wells will go down thousands of feet, turn right, and go through a bed of shale mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, infused with methane and benzene and propane and ethylene and uh, cadmium and lead and mercury and lots of other... Lots of nice things. Lots of good things. Yeah. Um, uh, and break up the rock using a series of chemicals uh, going down the well into the rock and then pulling out from that from these these shale beds, uh, the hydrocarbon product, bringing it up, sending it to a refinery, um, and pulling out natural gas, pulling out oil. Oil and gas are often mixed together in this process. I mean, in in the natural environment on the, or in the Earth's crust. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a number of things were done. The chemicals were made secret. So no restaurant is permitted to just dump uh, its uh, waste uh, into the gutter. But the oil and gas industry is permitted under the Cheney Energy Act of 2005 uh, to dump these chemicals, most of which are highly toxic for fracking, uh, into uh, the environment. Uh, and of course, there's, it's been proven that, that there's been dramatic impact to the water resources, the water table, aquifers, and groundwater both uh, through this process. The Natural Gas Act was amended to allow people to say that uh, the fact that a company wants to do a natural gas product project excuse me is defined as a public need mm -hmm. so the Department of Energy is supposed to review major natural gas projects um, including exporting natural gas uh, and the, the fact that a company says they want to do it now is assumed to be the demonstration of public need Wow. Um, so, so they just have that's to say nice they want to do it and it and becomes a public become, need. It becomes a public uh -huh. need. That was okay. another one of the Cheney Amendments. Uh -huh. I mean, this was, this was planned very carefully. Yeah. And so fracking has dramatically increased the supply of natural gas, of methane, in the United States uh, to the point where the price has dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, the cost of buying natural gas in the United States is one-fifth the cost of buying it in Asia and one-third the price in Europe. So, so it's only really natural that <laughs> they want to export it. Exactly. Right, because they can make a whole lot of money, right. more money in, right. in China or in Asia. Than we don't want to reveal here. the chemicals we're using. We don't want any regulation over the process. Um, we don't want you to think about the uh, emissions into the air and into the land and into the water, all of which are occurring dramatically throughout right. the country with this renegade mm -hmm. fracking. Um, because we're doing all of this to increase your energy security. All right. Now, on the other hand, we want to sell it overseas because we can create a few jobs through building these, these huge plants. Um, and the energy industry, the 1%, can make hundreds of billions of dollars uh, by selling it overseas. And the other thing that's important about this, this move to export, and all of these LNG plants and pipeline proposals, have flipped from in import to export now mm -hmm. because of the pure economics of trying to globalize this this uh, resource and and equalize the costs. Uh, this natural gas would then go to countries that have minimal, in many cases, uh, environmental standards and labor standards. In, in some parts of China, we know the the labor standards range from severe exploitation to near slavery mm -hmm. uh, and that's on a good day yeah. uh, it's i mean apple has just been embarrassed into into trying to um, clean up uh, labor standards and labor exploitation mm -hmm. that had led to um, uh, suicides and uh, severe damage to people's hands and and uh, you know, lots and lots of things that we wouldn't put up with for a second right. yeah. in this country. Okay. In the coal plants and the manufacturing plants in China, it's even it's much, much worse. Okay. I'm going to interrupt you because we're almost at the end of our half uh -oh. hour already. Oh, my. Okay. This has been too much fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has been. Uh, so uh, what were originally branded as being, being plans to bring in uh, natural gas are now being 
uh, redirect it to export natural gas. And that's happening yes. with coal terminals also? Yes. Okay, which there are a number of plans in Oregon to build them and, and on Washington, the Columbia there, there's, and in Washington. Right? Yes, okay. e exactly. And the, the, the upshot of this is that it's crazy to continue to burn fossil fuels when we have clean alternatives. It's even crazier to export them to other people uh, who would make it that much worse and who would use manufacturing processes uh, that take good jobs out of this country uh, and there's no need to. Uh, so people who want to make a difference, people who want to, um, the Oregon Sierra Club is working hard on these issues. There are lots of other good groups mm -hmm. out there who, who care about these issues. Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy, Oregonian, excuse me, OregonRenewables.com, uh, the Oregon.SierraClub.org uh, uh, for what we're doing uh, with the Sierra Club. There are lots of good ways for people to get involved and to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, local action, I think, is what's going to make the difference for the long term. Yeah. And what I particularly like and why I was interested in having you as a guest today was because you're working on both. You're working on both the stopping the damage uh, and you're also working on with the Oregonian Renewable Energy Policy on the solution to the problem. Well, I think it's really right. imperative to do both. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, there's a, a great woman in town named Barbara Ford. If you haven't had her mm -hmm. on, you should. She's, uh, um, she was also arrested at the Tar Sands. But she makes the point that there is so much that needs to change that people can work on whatever really touches them and be a productive contributor to the solutions we need. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, David. Okay, great, good. So we've been talking with uh, Ted Gleichman, with, uh, who's chair of the Liquefied Natural Gas Community C Committee of the Oregon Chapter of the Sierra Club. And we want to uh, put up his, yeah, there's the uh, website for Oregon Sierra Club and uh, their phone numbers. So you could give them a call and get in contact with Ted if you want to help him out with that campaign. We want to thank our crew for being here. We want to thank Roger Bates, Beth Kerwin, Dave King, Janet Morris and Tom Thomas. Without them being here, uh, we wouldn't be on the air, so thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed the program and that you will uh, join us again next week. Bye. <laughs>